Hey programmers, welcome back to another episode of System Design and Architecture series. In this episode, we're going to be talking about circuit breakers and why exactly you as a backend developer or system architect need to be able to use it to increase the resiliency of your services. Just notice that I didn't use the word microservices because it doesn't have to be a microservice architecture, but any other architecture where you have services, be it a Node.js service or a Spring service, anything that can communicate with your external modules. Okay, it can even be a, an API gateway. So what is resiliency in this context and how does circuit breaking actually fit into this. So first of all, why do we need resiliency? Imagine you're Netflix and millions of users are watching movies on your platforms. Obviously, you want to be full tolerant and always make sure that your platform is reliable and can serve users. So first of all, this means a failure in a service dependency shouldn't break the user experience. Meaning if a service A contacts service B and makes a request as we have here, if the service B is failing, the service A shouldn't have any degradation in the user experience. Second of all, its API should automatically take corrective actions when the dependency fails, meaning the API of the service A, so the API should still be able to return data. And we're gonna be talking about it in a minute about which corrective actions you can take. And the last one is that API should be able to show us what's happening right now, meaning we should be able to lock these degradations or these errors from the service A, showing that our circuit breaker is actually working and that we are more or less resilient in our actions. So what is it actually a circuit breaker? Let's first define it. Well, as we already said, service A is going to make a call to service B and the B is the one that is failing, okay? And this call is failing here. So first of all, why do we need a circuit breaker? Because the wasteful calls that are failing here, and for example, this one is failing, this can these kind of failing calls can pile up on service B and it's going to escalate the issue because these calls are going to consume the service B's memory. And it's the same the other way. These dangling calls that the service A is issuing can use the initiator's threads while waiting for their target. So imagine the service B is not returning any response. It's not telling us that the request has failed or the request has succeeded. So the service A is going to issue all these requests and simply wait. And while we're waiting with 10 issued requests, obviously our threads are going to be occupied and the service A is going to become slower. The third point is that this issue can cascade. So imagine there's another service behind our service A that's contacting the service A and the service A is contacting the service B. So if B is failing, it's going to return an error an issue or cause an issue to service A and service A is going to cause an issue to the service behind that or before that. So it's it's a cascading issue that we should be able to take care of. And last but not least, log pollution. Our logs are going to be filled with these cascading error messages and we don't want that. So for this, we have a circuit breaker and circuit breakers are something that you can implement on your own or use an external library. I just want to explain the theory behind, okay? So the circuit breaker has three states. It can be closed, meaning it doesn't interrupt the flow of the request. It can be open, meaning it's on top of the request and it's basically blocking the request. Actually, the idea of a circuit breaker is coming from electrical engineering. Imagine this is a current, of this line or the request that we're making and we can add a circuit breaker or open it with a switch and then there is current is no longer reaching the service B. It's the same idea that we have here on our backend. And it also can be half open, meaning it's not closed like this one, but it's half open, meaning it's it's still allowing some amount of request or the current if we're talking about the electrical engineering. And we also have some counts that we also take care of or keep track of because if it's closed and suddenly we start getting errors, we are going to open the circuit breaker, meaning we're going to stop letting service A to contact service B because con service B is having issues serving our request. So we should probably stop it and at least wait. So how do we wait actually? We open the circuit breaker and then we define some number of failure accounts. A failure count is going to be a number of failures, failed requests that will indicate that, hey, 
it's time to open the circuit breaker. And now it's open. Or actually, it doesn't open right away. We go to the half open state first. That's my, that's my mistake. We go from close to half open. And now only half of our requests are reaching service B. And then we realize that, hey, our service B failed like 10 times already. So it probably doesn't make sense to allow request to reach it anymore. And then we go to the open state. Open state means no requests are going to reach service B because it's erroring out anyway. And then as soon as we have an open state, we can still sometimes switch for to the half open state. And how exactly do we do that? Well, we also have another variable next attempt, which holds a date that tells our circuit breaker, hey, if you're in open state in five or 10 minutes, switch to an half open state and allow some requests to proceed. Okay, let's say we waited five minutes and now two out of 10 requests are working out still bad. And now we wait another five minutes and now nine out of 10 requests are actually successful. Well, what happens now? Well, it depends on our success count variable. If the success count is like 90%, then our, our circuit breaker is going to go from half open to closed again, meaning our circuit breaker is switched off and we're going to allow all the requests to go again. Let's actually go over to the code to illustrate how this would work in real life. So first of all, we're going to uh, create an instance of the circuit breaker object. And the circuit breaker object has this method called dot exec. So exec does the following. We're going to check for the state open. If it's an open state, meaning the service breaker is on, so we're not able to make any um, any requests or direct redirect any request to the service B. But if the next attempt is uh, passed by already, so our time is over the next attempt time, then we switch it to half open just the way as I explained it a couple of minutes ago. Otherwise, we suspend the call and say circuit suspended, you shall not pass. Otherwise, we're proceeding with our request. And based on that, we're uh, calling either a success or failure. And the, the most interesting part was already here. But let's go over to success as well. So the success method is here. Obviously, if it's half open, we're still going to increase the success count and see if we pass the success tre threshold. If we did success uh, pass the success threshold, meaning our service B has been failing too many times. So we're going to set the state to closed. Okay. Otherwise, we uh, yeah, proceed and we'll leave return a success. By the way, we also have third party packages for like NPM and Spring Boot. For NPM and Express, you probably would go with a possum, meaning you don't have to implement your custom code that we just saw in the in, in VS Code in my code editor, but you can just grab this possum package and plug it into your system and have a circuit breaker right away. Same with for Java developers. Spring Cloud comes with a built-in circuit breaker. Okay, now with this explained, here are some tips that you need to keep in keep in mind. First of all, here's an idea of fail fast, fail on time. And this is what the circuit breaker tells us or brings us. Meaning if the service A is making a call to service B and it's failing, it failed once, it failed twice, just don't proceed. You have to fail now and at least have some time for to let the service B to recover. So this is the idea of failed fast. And it's a it's a famous concept in system design and architecture area. Right. The next one is fail proactively. What does it mean? This is something that we discussed in the beginning of the video, meaning that if we have a failure, you should have a fallback, meaning if there's another service or a replica of the service, maybe we should redirect the calls to that in a, in a different node. Or the second one is maybe if you have a default value that, that we can return to the user or to our service, maybe just return that from some middleware. And the third resort is actually serve something from the cache. But meaning if the if the calls are failing, so maybe you have a cache somewhere here in between that actually can return data to your service A, right? And the last but not least, some extra considerations. So the circuit breaker should be able to act differently based on different exception times. Obviously, we, we have different exception times uh, types. Some of them are fatal, where you need some developer interactions. Some of them are recoverable. So if let's say you think that the issue is recoverable, maybe you don't actually have to turn on the service breaker or customize it somehow. Second of all, manual overrides. 
let's say an operator of your system, some kind of a developer, should be able to have access to manually switch on and off the circuit breaker, just the way as you can do in electrical engineering. Uh, third thing is mind resource differentiation. This means we're going to, again, customize our circuit breaker to also take into account what kind of resource we're requesting from the service B. Fourth point, accelerated circuit breaking. There can be times, again related to the first point, where you want to fail even faster or have a timeout even longer. Then, obviously, going back here, you would tweak these failure count numbers and success count numbers to fit your uh, specific needs, all right? And replaying failed requests. Again, you can tweak those numbers on how many times you want to replay your failed requests or have some kind of a... Um, exponential back off. I already made a short video on re retry mechanisms because circuit breakers are built on top of the retry mechanisms. So make sure to check it out to know about different replying or replaying retrying mechanisms. And last point is not suited for, meaning circuit breakers are not suited for local private resources. Meaning if you're contacting one module within your monolith or, or within your platform, probably doesn't make sense to add a circuit breaker there. You, you better just fix this issue as long as it's not an external module. And the second point is that don't add the circuit breaker everywhere in your code, all right? Don't add it to every HTTP request. You only should add a circuit breaker to parts where you need that this part, okay, we're contacting something third party, we need some resilience here. All right, this was it, guys. If you liked it, make sure to subscribe and leave a like and check out the whole playlist of system design and architecture. And I will see you in the next video.